Have you ever wondered if Rome ever tried to conquer Ireland, or how a leader becomes a despot? Well, have we got a story for you. This is the AD History Podcast, weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD, powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo, and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. Patrick, we have a special surprise in the form of a special guest today. Yes, you couldn't have said it better. Um, Well, you said brought to you via London and New York City, and while that is two-thirds of the way there, you kind of got uh, an extra place. Would you like to introduce our guest, Paul? Yes, also brought to you live via Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, Today we are joined by JJ McCullough, who is a notable educational YouTuber, contributor to the Washington Post, National Review, Huffington Post, essentially every Canadian periodical of record, as well as for both of North America and Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by JJ McCullough. JJ, thank you for coming and joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, absolutely. And it's wonderful to have you as a guest. I I know in terms, I know history is explicitly not necessarily within your ballpark, but you bring so much to the table today based on your works and your insights, which is at this point really quite voluminous that, you know, we thought you would be a natural addition to how we prosecute AD history. Well, thank you. That's very flattering. I, uh, yeah, I'm not, certainly when it comes to like a, you know, sort of pre- 19th century history i'm i'm pretty i'm pretty <laughs> ignorant but uh i will i will do my best this is definitely pre 19th century <laughs> yes. oh yeah we got we have a long way to go but you do get we all get to dip our foot today into the 20th century later on in our special segment but we're going to dive into today with patrick who has something very special for us but before we begin let's lay down our legendary and obligatory AD History Podcast Ground Rules. 1. Evaluate events in the context they occurred. 2. Over the span of recorded history, the way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it 50 years ago. 3. Nothing in history was inevitable. And 4. History and the past is like a different country. Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Paul. So we are on 81 to 90 AD, and I kind of wanted to do something a little bit different this time. Instead of focusing on a key event, I want to focus on multiple events that were happening over this time period in a certain part of the world. And that is, of course, with Roman Britain. Um, The last time we checked in on Roman Britain, the Romans had just successfully defeated Boadicea That was back in around 60 to 61 AD. We're not sure on the exact time year that happened. So what I wanted to know is what happened between then and 80 AD. And then what did the next 10 years have in store for the Romans and Britons on the island of Great Britain? So first, like I said, we need to ask ourselves what happened between 61 and 80. And 61 to 70 were actually rather peaceful years in Roman Britain. Not a lot actually happened in terms of big key events however of course over in rome nero's death happened and the year of the four emperors shook the entire empire with mutinies and uprisings and britain was no exception in all this and as we know vespasian eventually settled as emperor and he had actually previously led a legion on the island so this is just my own uh theorizing but he could have been quite well liked. I imagine if Vespasian had served time on Britain, the consensus could have been that he was liked on the island by the Romans serving over there, and it probably would have been quite a good move. They probably would have been happy to keep on his side. He was one of he was one of their own, possibly in some sort of way. So by 70 AD, the Romans had a large chunk of modern England under their control. And this is roughly up to say modern Manchester and east from there. And if you guys are looking through my notes, and I'm sure you guys will have to find a picture for yourselves if you're listening at home, you kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. It goes like adjacent to Wales and around Manchester, it crosses off. That's 
where the Romans had control by 70 AD, but of course, we aren't done there. So by 71 AD, after 10 years of relative peace, Vespasian decided, I want more of Britain. So uh, the Romans started to go up more, go up north and claim more land from the Celts. And by 74 AD, the Romans had claimed all the way up to modern day Carlisle in Cumbria, which is just south of the Scottish border. And then by 78 AD, the Romans had finally got their hands on Wales. Now, if you were uh, listened to the episode about Boadicea and uh, where we've briefly talked about Roman Britain, you will know obviously the Welsh resisted for quite some time. So it's, it's kind of sad in some way to see them finally fall to the Roman Empire. So by 80 AD, pretty much all of the island of Great Britain was under Roman rule, minus Scotland, which is something we'll definitely talk about in a moment. I'm sure there'll be some questions about that a bit later on. By 81 AD, where this episode begins, London had grown existentially and really solidified itself as the capital of Roman Britain, despite how tarnished and destroyed it was by Boudicca years earlier. It now had its own basilica, a forum, governor's palace, and even an amphitheatre. And if you remember, uh, Colchester was the initial capital of uh, Rome. So this really isn't bad for a backup capital. And not only had the Romans sort of geographically started to take over all the land, but Romanization has started to culturally take over the land. Um, Romans started to influence uh, Celtic aristocrats to abandon traditional British culture and adopt a more Roman style, like uh, speaking Latin, uh, Roman sort of statues and togas. And this seems to have been successful, and there still is heavy Roman influence in Britain to this day, whether that be architecturally or in our language. This really was quite successful. And the governor of Britain at this time was a man named Agricola. He was responsible for all this aforementioned conquering of Northern England and Wales. So that gets us up to speed as what was happening just in brief between the last time we checked on the Romans and now when we're checking on the Romans. And there were three, I would say, three key events in Roman Britain that I want to share in just a little bit more detail with you all. And the first one of those events happened in 82 AD, where Rome contemplates invading Ireland. So at this time, just a fun fact, uh, the Romans called Ireland Hibernia, I don't know the origins of that name, I'm afraid. Um, maybe another time we can talk about that. And in 82 AD, Agricola turned his eye to the land and thought, I could possibly take that for Rome. He thought, not only I could possibly, he was pretty secure. He thought, no, I definitely could take it. And what the Romans knew of Ireland at that time is that very much like Britain before the Romans got there, it was settled by various Celtic tribes. Uh, historian Tacitus, who I'm sure we've talked about before, claimed that an overthrown Irish king found his way to Britain and Agricola, and this king supposedly offered to help Agricola and Rome conquer Ireland due to his knowledge and the contacts he had in Ireland. He was helping, you know, he felt his nation had betrayed him, so he was going to help the other guys betray that nation. So Agricola was very much contemplating invading Ireland and taking it for Rome, and he thought it would be a relatively easy task. And he was even tempted to take just one legion of Roman soldiers with him to claim the entirety of Ireland, which was around 5,000 men. And he thought of this just because of how easily Rome claimed the rest of Europe. He thought if we could get the rest of Europe that, that easily, surely just this one little island we could take, it would be a breeze to capture. And he also, Ireland had no central power. As I said, it was just a collection of tribes, it had no central defence plans, no sort of central lead, so he thought he could easily just ransack it uh, tribe by tribe and eventually claim it for Rome. And of course, he also thought he would have help from this um, usurped Irish king. Though, as we know, Ireland never actually came under Roman rule. Why was this if they could have taken it so easily? And there's a few ideas as to why the Romans never really took Ireland. One idea is that simply with so much land already under the Roman Empire, Resources were just being stretched thin, like there wouldn't be enough people. Like, taking Ireland would be one thing, but having it manned, having like things built over there, that would be a completely different option. It's just something they couldn't realistically do at this time because the empire was just getting so gosh darn big. And they were also more occupied with maintaining what they already had in the British Isles as opposed to claiming more. 
and with a mutiny in his own army was also occurring around this time and there was a rebellion going up in Scotland that really got in the way of his Irish plans. So Minus sort of flirting with the idea, Rome never went on to claim Ireland. However, Ireland and Rome, Rome and Britain did interact with one another. And this was mainly through sort of small bands of Irish Celts quickly uh, sailing over to Britain, doing some ransacking, getting some goods, getting some slaves, and quickly run, like, quickly sailing back to Ireland. So it did happen. There was connection between the two, but Ireland, as we know, stayed Roman free. And it, it, it's a very big what if. Well, how would Ireland, would Ireland be that different to this day if uh, the Romans did claim it? Who knows? Um, and the second big event I want to share about Roman Britain in this time happened, so some places I heard of it happening in 83 AD, and a, uh, some places said 84 AD, and this is the Battle of Mon Gripius. Forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. I believe Mon Gripius is the Grampians uh, today, so I might be wrong in saying that. And like I said, this battle happened in either of these years. We aren't too sure, and it was between the Romans, led by Agricola, and the native Picts of Scotland, led by Calgacus, if I'm saying that right once again. My uh, Scottish Celtic uh, pronunciation is at my strongest point. And we aren't sure exactly where this battle took place, but many sites have been suggested, and I've even seen some landmarks in Scotland saying, yes, this is it, this is where the battle happened, but that's, that's just to lure some tourists in. Um, the Picts rebelled as the Romans were starting to claim their land, and the historian Tacitus claimed that Romans had just 11,000 men and the Picts had 30,000 men. And the story goes is this battle began with just projectiles from either side firing at each other. But eventually the Romans start to march forward in their formations. And the Picts were not trained like the Romans. They, was, they had brute strength, but they didn't have the tactics or the cunning. Just, just the plans like the Romans had. So they rushed without order and were systematically just defeated and killed by the Romans. And the brute force of the Picts was no match for the Roman skills, as I mentioned. And Tacitus claimed that 10,000 Picts were killed in this battle, and just 360 Romans died, which, as we mentioned, there were supposedly 11,000 Romans and 30,000 Picts, so this is astonishing. However, this is somewhat debated because I believe Tacitus was close with Agricola, so some people debate that this may be over-exaggerated, as a lot of things are thought to be in uh, Roman history. So despite this clear victory, Agricola didn't advance, and due to the oncoming winter, he just retreated back south. And of course, much like Ireland, Scotland would never come under Roman rule. So we've talked about um, the Romans dealing with the Irish, the Romans dealing with the Scottish, and finally, just one extra thing that kind of that happened, just a small thing that happened during this time period, was in 87 AD. And this was just northern Britain being evacuated, so up to the most northernmost point the Romans had, which is kind of modern-day Cumbria, just below the Scottish border today. Um, and this happened because pressure started to mount in other parts of the Roman Empire, uh, and this is believed to be most likely uh, Dacia, which is modern-day Romania. And because of this, Rome withdrew troops from the most northern part of their claim on Britain so they could go protect the empire elsewhere. So that's just the, the last little thing of note I want to share with you guys. So what comes to it is, where was Roman Britain by 90 AD? This is quite a, quite a turbulent 10-year period for Roman Britain. And where were they by the end of it? So all of the island was under Roman control by 90 AD, minus Scotland, of course. And this is more or less how it would remain for the next 300 or so years. They wouldn't really gain or lose any more land until it all came crumbling down and um, the Roman Empire and Rome's time in Britain came to an end. And like I thought, what was so interesting about this, not only was Rome, like its borders becoming Roman, but its culture was becoming more Roman. And this evacuation of Northern Britain in 87 AD, it tells me that the Romans were very comfortable with where they were on the island. They felt comfortable in letting troops leave that part, and they weren't worried about the Britons overthrowing or taking over or revolting again. That's that's how much control they had over it all. Like I've sort of said here, how I've wrapped things up. I think by about this time, Britain was truly wrapped around Rome's little finger. 
I've, I always find it interesting reading about Roman Britain. It's something I'm quite attached to just because this is history of my country taking place here way before I was even born and it's shaping things I'm doing to this very day. But if you guys have any questions for me about this time in Roman Britain, I would love to hear them. So the first place I think I would want to weigh in here, Patrick, is the method by which Rome began to assimilate uh, native Britons into Roman culture. And I'm curious if you could give us some ways by which we began seeing Romanization in the British Isles during this decade. So good examples of Romanization is obviously the thing I'm most interested in a lot of time is the language. As we know, English is a language very influenced by Latin. A, a, a lot of uh, Celtic Britons in this time would have learned Latin and it's helped shape the language as it is to this very day. But like I was also saying, there's just so many remains of um, Roman relics from this past. And even today, like Bath is a incredibly Roman city. London itself is a Roman city. These cities that the Romans set up, that the uh, Britons looked after, they didn't tear them down once the Romans had gone. They were quite happy to keep them still, and they still stand to this day. But something I want to kick over to to JJ for just a moment, because there's a lot of interesting... Uh, parallels to modernity, even though we try to keep away from it, it, it's definitely applicable. And that is, all three of us live in what is known as the the free world. And this idea that somebody can come over to us, and the idea of whether it be uh, achieving residence or citizenship in the United States, Canada, the UK, in in your estimation, JJ, it's certainly in the in the modern context. How, how would you describe and rate the the power to inspire opportunity that comes with citizenship? Obviously, in our case, not Roman, but in a more modern context, the idea that you're coming from a place you certainly don't want to be. Probably a lot of people don't, and you have this great opening opportunity that, in theory, could happen in any one of our countries, and the power that surrounds that. Well, I mean, it's obviously sort of the, I think the sort of like the core of the patriotic sort of founding myth of a country like Canada or the US, the notion of, of a nation sort of built by immigrants, built by by newcomers, built by people seeking a better life. You know, that's actually uh, the motto of uh, Canada has two uh, uh, Latin mottos, which I guess is unto itself a sort of relic of our British past, which is a relic of the of the Roman past. Um, and yes. the mottos that Canada has is uh, they desire a better country, right? Which is this idea that, uh, you know, it's a country that's 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 built by by immigrants and thus has sort of that as part of our sort of founding sort of patriotic lore. It's it's sort of interesting, though, how we distinguish sort of like this modern concept of sort of immigration as as sort of like the founding foundation of, of, a, of, a, of a state like Canada or, or the United States versus the sort of history that we're talking about here, where you just basically sort of have uh, foreign powers conquering new territories and sort of settling and uh, imposing their cultures upon it, like that the Romans did to Britain, right? We don't, I mean, maybe in some ways we do sort of see this as all existing on a continuity of, of sort of, 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 of diversity and multiculturalism and the way that sort of like no no society is ever a product of only one culture. Every society that exists in the modern world today is to some degree a product of, of intermingling of cultures, of different cultural influences and, and that sort of thing, whether we're talking about sort of like, you know, the modern multicultural state of, of North America or, or even a country like Britain that I think we in the new world often think of as being, you know, like we in the new world, I think it's very easy to sort of like romanticize uh, Europe as being like, you know, this bastion of this kind of like pure culture that exists in these very like controlled walled off nation states that sort of have an auth an authenticity to them that we in the new world don't have because we're also mixed together and mingled but i think when you study periods of history like this you really realize the degree to which uh you know even even a culture like british culture english culture is actually the product of of a, of a great de degree of uh, you know quote unquote foreign influences that have sort of been internalized well, something that's interesting here is that it reminds me of a story. I was watching a few years back an interview with former Secretary of Defense James Mattis, and he was talking about his time commanding in Iraq. And his unit had just captured a prisoner, one that was trying to lay down an IED, 
And when they brought him in, and obviously they began talking to him, Mattis wanted to go and talk to him himself. And the thing that he was astonished by was when the very inkling of a of, of America and the life that can be led there was brought up by the the individual they captured, Mattis was utterly astonished that not a day before you have a fellow who was literally trying to kill his Marines and in captivity is aspiring to the possibility of a greater life, in this case, in the United States. And it really was a very poignant, certainly coming from a, a fellow like Mattis, demonstration certainly in his eyes of the power of aspiration and the ability to to simply live better and that story has always really stuck with me and it, it seems to be something of a of a timeless practice in this case because we were just talking about it earlier Patrick how mm. When they try to bring in the aristocratic class of all of these places and the various rights that come with cooperating with Rome, and really the biggest carrot that they could basically extend is the possibility of Roman citizenship. But in the case of conquered provinces, where pretty much no one there is a Roman citizen, because why would they be? And just because you're subject to Roman rule doesn't also make you a citizen— they had something of uh, an intermediate state, which they called Latin Rites, which were, ended up being established during the Social Wars, which was just something of a, a semi-civil war that happened a little under two centuries before. In fact, it's one of the big military conflicts where Sulla made his name all that time ago. And in doing so, basically, it, it extends the possibility, but it starts in this intermediate state where... It gives the individual the, the right to trade with Roman citizens and enter contracts with Romans. So naturally, you know, they're, they're, they're jingling the coin purse. Uh, in addition to that, having a legally recognized marriage, if they actually lived in Rome itself, they could vote. And from there, they had the ability to ascend to full Roman citizenship. So the Romans were definitely keenly aware of, of what this particular carrot could do in terms of, of soft power before potentially going to the stick. Because as we mentioned several times, Patrick, the Romans could do it the easy way, they could do it the hard way, they were interested in peace and order and paying your taxes. And the idea that instead of truly subjugating these people, assimilating them by giving them a share in the proverbial spoils. Definitely. No, yeah, as, as we mentioned before, Rome, yeah, Rome could do it the easy way or the hard way. Yeah, absolutely. And you were talking about Agricola, the fellow who was governor of Roman Britain during this time. And he's, he's an interesting figure because m most of our sources at this point during this time, especially when you're talking about Roman issues, comes from Suetonius and Tacitus. And Tacitus, in this case, was actually Agricola's son-in-law. That's the one. Yes, yes. Well, this is where things get interesting. So... Obviously, Agricola had a great deal of success in his time in Britain, to the point in which it was largely viewed that the extremely self-conscious and highly touchy Domitian, which we'll get into in our later segment, began looking at him as a threat and ultimately recalled him. He was offered a couple of positions later, like I believe he was offered a governorship in Africa, but he declined, and he died in his mid-60s. However, and Tacitus is certainly of this belief, he believes that Agricola did not actually die of natural causes. He believed that he was actually poisoned on the instructions of Domitian. And when you read Tacitus's biography of his father-in-law, Agricola, a lot of scholars read in between the lines, and this was published after both Agricola deaths and Domitian's death, for obvious reasons, which we'll get into later, but in this case, if you, when scholars begin reading between the lines when he's doing this biography of his father-in-law, it was definitely seen as a, as a rebuttal and as a rejection of the extreme censorship that occurred under Domitian's rule. And I thought that would be interesting to add here because it definitely dovetails into our uh, later segment. Yeah, 100% definitely. Uh, I, I remember reading uh, Tacitus and 
Agricola were close, and I I knew it was some sort of in-law. I, t- I didn't take note of it, and yes, son-in-law was definitely true. And it does it really does believe. Can we believe what this guy was writing about? Especially when it came to that uh, battle in Scotland, like thirty thousand Picts versus eleven thousand Romans, and the Romans were victorious in that. It does kind of raise alarm bells in your head. <laughs> Well, well, certainly, and this is something that I, I want to bounce off, JJ, because when we're talking about Romanization and the Roman presence in Britain, it has both, of course, the overt military conquest, and it has the more insidious cultural one, not just bringing in the elites and, and offering Roman citizenship, things like that, but, but things that are more basic, interpretation of law, property rights, rule of law, for that matter, that deeply influences Britain to this day. Now, of course, JJ, you and I both being citizens of two countries that were largely the product of British colonialism, in your eyes, because we both experience this in some ways, and and since Canada is still part of the Commonwealth and and the the PM is still effectively appointed by the Queen through the Governor General, I believe. And I'm curious, looking into your, your own system, what do you feel is in, in some respects, the most positive contribution of uh, that British connection, even though I know you have more than a few bones to, to pick with the British presence. Uh, as I recall, you are something of a staunch Canadian Republican, lowercase r. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, obviously, both Canada and the United States owe a great deal to their their British founding. They would be very different societies if they'd been founded by, by uh, any other uh, power. I mean, I think, you know, I, I did a video a while ago where I talked about sort of like the roots of of sort of the American legal system as is sort of popularly understood and, and how a lot of it very consciously evokes certain notions that were sort of established in, in Great Britain, like, you know, Magna Carta and, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of separation of powers between the different branches of the government, the executive versus the legislature versus the judiciary. And that sort of thing. And I mean, I think that those are, you know, those are the sort of the great moral foundations of, of, of North American democracy, I would say. And I feel like I'm sure, like you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm sure that if you go back far enough, you can probably trace the genesis of these things back to, back to Roman influences. I mean, certainly like the thing that I often think about is I was just talking about before how like, you know, Canada has still has Latin mottos, which is a sort of like strange artifact of, of this time. But the other place, of course, where you still see a great deal of, of Latin to this day is in the legal system, right? When we think about uh, all of sort of like the language that you use in court, you know, mens rea and, you know, corpus, uh, I, I don't know, all of these, you know, like this, the sort of the terminology, even when you're sort of saying that, like, yeah, quid quid pro quo. Quo. yeah, 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 uh, or even in full grande delicto. Yes, all of these kinds of all of these fun terms, right? Like they're they're. They're very present in, in, in Canada and, and the United States, which is, again, like a, a reflection of the fact that we inherited this tradition from Great Britain. But that is unto itself a reflection of the fact that Great Britain inherited this from, from Rome. So it is, it is sort of fascinating how all of these things have just such a much longer tail than I think we can realize. And then so in some respects, uh, you're asking, like, you know, well, what, what, what kudos do we give to, to the British? And it's like, well, is it the British truly that deserve some of this credit? Or should we be going even further back and, and sort of attributing it to our, our sort of shared collective Roman heritage? I mean, that's a kind of interesting way to think about it. You know, there's definitely a fascinating continuity here. You know, a few episodes ago, Patrick, you and I were talking about various influences on the place we grew up. In your case, in southern England, you can still very much see the Roman influence that exists even even to this day in terms of buildings, agriculture, legal system. And we are also talking about how where I grew up in southwestern Connecticut, we were part of the 13 colonies that revolted against the crown. And everywhere I look in my hometown, I can see various vestiges of that. Some of it's more, more overt. Some of it is more subtle. But there's the one thing that I did forget to mention when we did talk about that, Patrick, which was possibly the most infamous contribution by the British to my hometown, is during the American Revolution, during the Tryon Raids, when British regulars burned down my hometown. Huh. Quite hard to miss that, miss miss mentioning that one. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's one of those things where I, I look at the map now and I say to myself, boy, they did a really, really complete job of turning this place into a cinder. Mm. Yeah, they 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 raided everywhere from basically what's uh, 
on the northern coast of the Long Island Sound from Stanford almost all the way to Fairfield. Really, really fascinating stuff, especially when you consider in Upper Manhattan, there's an entire park named after General Tryon. That's where the cloisters are. But just just a little thing I, I wanted to insert there. And we're talking about conquering Ireland. And it's amazing because these Romans have, and they're certainly not alone, this incredible acquisitive blood that they see a place and they need to take it. <laughs> and I'm curious if in if you can go into any further detail about the complications that would have occurred in trying to cross the Irish Sea and conquering the Emerald Isle from the British perspective. As we mentioned in the past, getting across the uh, English Channel is harder than it looks despite its size. And I imagine the Irish Sea is very similar to that. It's a tough, probably a tough sea to traverse. Actually physically getting from Great Britain to Ireland would have been quite the feat um, in that day. So why, why didn't they? And I think a, a key reason of that is the Romans, even though they liked claiming everywhere, I read that they were also quite tactical with what they wanted to claim. They just sort of, I've I read some reports about, they just thought, we can't really do much with this land. We could claim it, but what's the point? We can't really farm it or create settlements there. It's far too cold for anything like that. So perhaps I had the same opinion of Ireland. I believe Homer once described Ireland as just like a foggy marshland. So perhaps they had that idea that Ireland wasn't that fertile or usable either. So they thought we could claim it, but what's the point? <laughs> Well, one thing is definitely for sure. If they were initially operating on Strabo's map, they would have had quite a long voyage. Mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. basically they basically have Ireland in the place of Iceland mm. in that work, not to bring it back around again. I was just going to say, are there other, other examples of that, just out of curiosity, like where the Romans just couldn't be bothered to conquer sort of certain parts of Europe? Yes. Yeah, it did happen. So... You're, I'm sure you're familiar with their long and, well, rather their prolonged struggle with the various Germanic tribes. So basically, they had been fighting them for, for quite a while, and it came to a point where Rome basically decided not to expand beyond the Danube, and they spent a lot of time on, on the Rhine as well, because in addition to the great cost of fighting these people, and these were these were tribes that were in no position nor had any inclination to genuflect to any foreign power. They didn't see it as a land that was certainly worth the sacrifice necessary, one, to conquer it, and, and two, to, to satiate it. Even though boundaries kind of fluctuated over time, eventually the, when they got to Germany, they, they came to a point based on the resistance and what it would offer to them, even if they did control it, and they said, okay, enough. So yeah, there are definitely a couple examples of that to be sure. They were very, very practical. They knew what they wanted. And uh, while there certainly was a great deal of overt pride that guided a lot of Roman thinking and decision-making, at the end of the day, they understood the arithmetic and what was worth it and what the payoff was. And there were definitely just certain situations where they said, eh, pass. And something I forgot to mention, and this is just a silly aside, a lot of Scottish people like to claim, oh, we were never taken over by, by the Romans. Like, they didn't want you, Scotland. <laughs> Don't be too proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, 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 that's interesting to me because I, I was sort of... Uh, something that I've often sort of been a little bit interested in is, is, is this idea, you know, sort of like the pride that the Scots and, and the Irish have for being like very distinct from, from Britain in, in, in their mind. Um, and would you say, Patrick, that like a lot of that is really rooted in this moment of history, like that the Roman, uh, the fact that, that Britain, England was conquered by Rome and sort of fell under Roman influence, but then Scotland and Ireland didn't. Is that kind of like, would you say like that's sort of like the seed of this whole sort of like modern nationalistic kind of conception of, of sort of the Celtic uh, Scotland and Ireland as being very culturally different than uh, than in England? I really would, you know, this is that's just my own claim. I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of angry Irish and Scottish people at me and a lot of angry English people at me saying that. But I do think <laughs> there is something in it for that. that. The fact that Scotland and Ireland were never claimed and they have a, a much stronger heritage for it. I, maybe that heritage would still be there. But a lot of people, like, in its most simple sense, a lot of people know the strong caricature for a Scottish person and an Irish person, that sort of thing. They have a much more distinct culture, history, and I do wonder to myself, what what would have changed if Ireland and Scotland had been taken over by the Romans? What, 
would, would we have more of a shared national identity? Would the four countries of the UK have that more shared identity if they did all come under Roman rule? And it's a really, it's like, yeah, it's a really fascinating idea. I do think it it does root quite strongly from this initial claiming of the land, that, and it still resonates to this day. There still is that distinction between the four countries of the UK, and especially England and Wales having a more shared identity when compared to Scotland and Ireland. And of course, Ireland, part of a large chunk of Ireland is even part of the UK anymore. It's very held, much held on to that own identity. It's it's interesting to me just because I know as well, like, well, I mean, it sometimes gets to the idea of like, well, what is sort of like the historical myth versus what is sort of like the historical reality? And I feel like that in some respects, like the myth of not being conquered by Rome and the idea that like they were able to preserve an authenticity is 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 the very sort of powerful sort of aspect of this. Because, I mean, what I've what I've learned over the years is that a lot of sort of like what is presented as being like the authentic sort of Celtic culture of Scotland or Ireland is actually like much more sort of modern than than we think it is like that. A lot of it was mm. sort of like born by sort of neo Celtic revivalism in like the Victorian times. You know, that was sort of like when things like the like the tartans and like the caber tossing and, and all these sorts of things sort of became mainstream, right? Like that they were sort of built from a sort of like revivalist kind of uh, ethic that was often very speculative, what they assumed that sort of like pre-British uh, Scotland and, and Ireland was like. And so that's uh, that's that's always just sort of something that I've 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 found to be kind of interesting is to like to what degree that the Brits actually might have been the English might have been quite successful at actually removing a lot of that that Celtic culture and that it was the sort of like the romantic notion of the lost Celtic culture and sort of a desire to like consciously reconstruct it based in a kind of speculative way and thus return to this kind of like idealized pre-British pre-Roman uh, idea of of the British Isles as being like the true character of of Scotland and Ireland. I mean, it's it's these sort of things are always so so blurry, and I think that a lot of the ways that sort of nationalism and patriotism manifest is kind of glossing over a lot of the complexities of the situation and 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 sort of pining for this very idealized, pure version of the culture that that no one you know obviously living today has any conscious memory of but sort of sentimentalizes the idea of like the one time in which we were truly free of all foreign influence and we were our most authentic selves. And I, I, when I, having, you know, I've been to Ireland, I haven't been to Scotland, but I've certainly known a lot of proud Scottish people over the years. And I do often feel like that, that, that pining, for like the, the, the moment of their purest, most authentic self is still a very big part of sort of like their, their nationalistic ethos. And still for that matter, informs the reasons why you have things like Scottish, you know, separatism and, uh, you know, the unification of Ireland and all of these kinds of ideas that are still obviously very politically salient to this day. Well, that was definitely, uh, <laughs> speaking of salient, an excellent dissection of of modern ideology uh, insofar as its cultural implications for movements like, say, the SNP, which, of course, obviously has it has extraordinarily extraordinary implications to us right now. Hmm. Top of the class, as always, Patrick. Before we hand it off to Anna, though, if you like AD history and you want to help out the show, be sure to leave a glowing five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions, comments, or inquiries for Patrick and myself, be sure to email them to us at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. And now, take it away, AD. This is the AD History Podcast. Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History PC and the hashtag AD History. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. Now back to Paul and Patrick. So, Patrick, we're heading in here into a special segment, because during our last episode, it was only a few days short of the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, the day in which the allies of the United States, British Empire, of course, Canada is included there as well, they were quite important, and the Soviet Union defeated Nazi Germany and its European Axis collaborators, and had this pandemic not broke out, the there would have been some rather extended 
uh, celebrations and events for this, but obviously that's been quite muted. And so when we look back after 75 years at the Second World War, we wanted to know from you guys, what did you, what do you believe in terms of the popular memory of the Second World War are the most important overlooked facts? So naturally, we wanted to know your thoughts on this question. And our first submission that we're choosing today is actually from YouTube by our user Sapien, who has uh, very keenly submitted some very interesting insights before. Quote, I think the most overlooked thing about World War II is that there was a war outside of Europe as well. This is the reason why about video games everyone says, I'm tired about World War II. They're actually tired of the 100th time that you storm Normandy or the Reichstag. By the Second World, but the Second World War was also in East Asia. Without Nazis, I don't know anything about it. Close quote. And this is interesting, guys, because it, it does point to um, a larger perspective on, on certainly in our countries, considering we fought as the Western Allies during this conflict. We very much focus on, as you might imagine, our national histories, because that's usually where everyone, everywhere starts. Anytime you're in a given country, usually the most popular histories are the histories of the country in question. And it is interesting because when it comes to the Second World War, there definitely is a, a very almost exclusively European view of the conflict. But of course, it was a global conflict. And in this case, I, at least personally, and I'm curious to get your guys' insights, you know, the, the two things that really get overlooked, interestingly enough, is that one, China was part of the Allies and had actually been fighting two years before war even broke out in Europe when Hitler invaded Poland. In fact, when you look back at the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937, there are certain scholars who make the argument, and it's not unfounded, that in fact, the Japanese invasion of mainland China, which is not to be confused with taking over Manchu Kuo in 1931, could very, very well be described as the beginning of the conflict. But it's just one example of how, especially when you're looking you know, strictly from one's national perspective in the popular sense, major contributions such as that and the facts that surround them so often get overlooked. I think you're dead on there, Paul. If if you asked me, hey, name something that happened in World War II outside of Europe, th there's only two things that come to mind immediately for me, and they're probably the two obvious ones, and that's of course, relates to the US and Japan. That's uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the nuclear bombs. I, but they're huge events. I, I totally agree with Sapien's comments here that so many of us are uneducated, on what happened outside of Europe. And you know, it's called a world war for a reason. I remember uh, many years ago, I met this older guy, old Canadian guy, and we were just talking about stuff. And he just sort of like casually mentioned how during the Second World War, his brother died in Egypt. And I remember that just sort of struck me as very strange because it's like I never thought of like a Canadian soldier dying in Egypt during World War II. I never even th think about Egypt as being part of the war in any way. But there was, uh, you know, there was a sort of Middle Eastern dimension to the conflict as well. You know, uh, oh, is the one Nazi was called like the Desert Fox or something because like I'm completely ignorant. Erwin Warhammel was the Desert Fox. Yeah, yeah. So it's like there was this whole sort of like that dimension of it that I'm just like profoundly ignorant of because as well, like you just think of it as was, was a war that was fought primarily in Europe and then to like a much lesser extent in in uh, in the Pacific, but uh, yeah, but there, there was all these other sorts of like aspects of it too, and there was also a sort of um, there was even even in parts of the world where there wasn't necessarily fighting, there was all this sort of diplomatic stuff that was going on as well. Like I know that there was, uh, I was reading recently about um, some Disney movies that were made in in sort of the nineteen forties that were designed to propagandize the South Americans to not ally with the uh, with the Axis powers, right? So like there was all this sort of like, how did yeah, I miss this? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, man. So like, there was D Disney made some sort of. Uh, have you, I don't know if you've ever seen that uh, these Disney films that involve like these um, two Latin American sort of bird characters who are like Donald Duck's friends, 
Like one is like a, a parrot and then one is like, a, I don't know, some other bird. And they're like Latinos and they're like Donald Duck's friends and Donald, they take Donald Duck to Latin America. And so like they realize like how the Latin American cultures are fascinating and interesting and good friends of the United States. And like this was a sort of characters and storylines that the Walt Disney Company made up in working with the U.S. government in order to sort of propagandize the Latinos to like feel warm things about the U.S. and, and thus sort of like the the allies and thus not sort of fall into uh, the orbit of the Axis powers, which the Axis powers were trying to reach out to to that part of the world as well. So, yeah, like there's in addition to just like the strictly war dimension of, of the world war, there was uh, obviously a, a, a huge sort of diplomatic political uh, part of it too because like every part of the world uh, was strategically important right so you didn't want to leave any of it uh, in any sort of ambiguous uh, ambiguous political uh, uh, climate well it's it's all that, that i had no idea i know i knew that that disney and various other studios had created various kinds of propaganda throughout the world including some rather noted uh animated stuff but in this case the other reason i think this is uh prevalent has a lot to do, in fact, with how we prosecuted the war itself. So in terms of this becoming a global conflict, and I, I, this is something I want to touch on later, but the fact of the matter is that when it came to prosecuting the war, the one thing that the major allies could all agree upon was that Germany came first. They called it the Germany first policy. We actually uh, had a secret conference, the United States and Great Britain, about uh, 10 or 11 months before the war came to the United States, basically agreeing that the decisive theater, should they join together in war against Germany, will take precedence against all else. So it was almost, especially when you're talking about the United States and its various resources and creating uh, the arsenal of democracy, about 70 percent of our resources in the United States were going towards Europe, whereas about 30 percent were going into Japan. And they basically split it that most of what was produced um East of the Mississippi went to Europe, and most of what was produced west of the Mississippi went to the Pacific. That and there's a certain undeniable uh, drama that comes around Nazi Germany and and everything that adds to the conflict, especially when we're talking about a, a European peoples that you know prior you know very shortly prior to the conflict it breaking out itself. There were so many people around the world that didn't believe that the Germans were capable of the things that they ultimately did. So I think there's something of an odd, dark appeal to the European theater as well. Mm -hmm. Couldn't put it better myself. So, so we have another message from at VGC Kenny on Twitter. And of course, you guys can tweet us to hashtag AD History Podcast at AD History Pod. Just thought I'd get a plug in there. And uh, VGC Kenny writes to us, Tangentially related, during the signing of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, a French official by the name of Ferdinand Foch stated, This is not peace, this is an armistice for 20 years, which is both harrowing and kind of cool in its own right. And that is, yes, harrowing and kind of cool, and just so dead on the mark. <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing about Marshal Foch is, you know, now extremely infamous statement in 1919 when the Versailles Treaty was, was signed is that he actually did not live to see his uh, prediction come true. He died in 1929. And I've always been very curious to, to see what his reaction would have been. Would it have been one of surprise? Would it have been nonchalant? Or would he have been just as disturbed by it as anybody who hears that quote for the first time? Hmm. I wonder why he picked 20 years. Obviously, we know it's dead on, but how fortunate that he picked you know, the exact right time frame. I wonder what was going through his mind when he uh, said that. I can only guess, but the fact that 20 years pretty well demarcates a full generation, I think, is something that probably factored into it. He, no, he, he was absolutely dead on the mark, and so... And this is something that's that's worth asking here because there's there's this ongoing debate about how Britain and France should have handled this, especially when Hitler is appointed chancellor and you have basically the Nazis taking over in late thirty two, early thirty three. Would this war have been avoidable had Britain or France acted differently in terms of how they enforced the Treaty of Versailles in the intervening years? I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are. 
I don't know. I mean, I, I have such a hard time sort of engaging with sort of counterfactuals, you know, because we don't know just how many variables were critical in, in determining what, what happened or, or what didn't happen. I mean, I also sort of like, you know, know, I've studied Hitler a fair bit myself. I'm a little bit less sort of likely to believe that that Hitler was just kind of like this somewhat generic symptom of a of a sort of sick society or, or a broken society. I think he was just such a unique and particular person that it's 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 hard to see anything about him as simply being a a sort of natural byproduct of a, of a of a sort of like larger geopolitical problem. Patrick and I kind of walk this line between uh, the great man theory of history as well as, you know, the greater contextual flow of history. And because I, I've, I've never been settled on either one being entirely correct, and, and I actually completely agree with you in regards to uh, Hitler and his place in all of this. You know, imagine not having—imagine the 18th—excuse me, the 19th century if Napoleon had never come around— you know, the, yes. these are fellows that, by all means, by force of personality and their role, uh, undoubtedly change history in a way that it would be unrecognizable otherwise. You know, when it comes to this question about the debate in regards to enforcing the Treaty of Versailles, was it too strict, was it not? I once heard a very interesting alternative interpretation that I think is really valuable here. And in this case, that largely comes along the idea that in when Germany and the Central Powers surrendered in late 1918 and they're negotiating Versailles, that it was an agreement that would never work for two very specific reasons. And, and it had to do with a, a very unique point in history that was occurring at that time, which is two great powers, namely Germany and Russia, which was, of course, then uh, becoming the, the Soviet Union, Two uh, tremendous continental powers that at that particular moment in time both happened to be on their back. And within a generation, they're both return in force with a, a decided weight in world events. And that given the unique time in which this, uh, this treaty was concluded, based on those two very important factors being entirely absent, that it was a treaty that by virtue of that specifically, in reality, never had much of an ability to be any sort of, of long-term solution or arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know what more to add. I think you, you phrased that, that quite well. Yeah. Okay. So we're going on to our, our next our next one. This is actually via email, via Jobert in Queens. I'm assuming he's talking about Queens, New York. Quote, that Americans fought on the same side as the Russians against the Germans, close quote. Uh, this is a kind of an interesting one, guys. Uh, this may be anecdotal, but I feel like I've heard this quite a few times just in terms of kind of like um, like a like a Tonight Show, uh, Jay, you know, Jay Leno jaywalking segment. You guys familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Man on the street kind of thing. Yeah. And... I've, I've heard of instances where people have done things like that, and, the, and they asked who... The United States fought in World War II and with their allies, and there was a a disturbing um, amount of answers which said that we fought with Germany against the Soviet Union, which I'm sure partially has to do with blending in of later Cold War history, but that's a little bothersome. Yeah, it really I mean, is. It's 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 it's, it's, it's but it, it is sort of like surreal though. I think in retrospect, in, in sort of defense of that particular line of ignorance. I mean, like, there's no excuse for the ignorance of not being aware that we were fighting against Hitler in World War II. I mean, that's pretty mainstream. But on the other hand, it is kind of, I think it is still very strange in retrospect that uh, when you see these pictures of like Churchill and Roosevelt sitting with Stalin and sort of like yucking it up, like, you know, best buddies, right? Just knowing like what a sort of like demonic figure sort of Stalin became in kind of the popular imagination of the West. It is... And, and the Soviet Union, for that matter. So it is it is kind of very odd. And actually, it's something that I often wonder about. Like, I'm not super familiar with this. But like, to what degree, sort of like the Western powers and sort of Western propaganda was sort of like in denial or like purposely uh, suppressing knowledge of the reality of, of Stalin's regime for the purposes of the war? Like, was there a time in which 
the Soviet Union was actually warmly regarded in, in Britain and America for reasons beyond simply that they were our allies in the war. Like, was there actually a time in which the Soviet Union under Stalin would have been seen as, as like a, a desirable society in any regard? Because I think nowadays we're much more likely to, uh, to see uh, sort of Stalin's Russia and Hitler's Germany as, as being very sort of like morally uh, continuous and, and basically existing on sort of like the same base level of, of, of evil. And so I just often kind of like wonder when that. Well, you know, it's interesting that you, you, you pose that question. In London, there's a very famous statue sitting there that's a bench. And on the far end, on one far end, you have Roosevelt sitting there, you know, kind of doing his Roosevelt yucking it up thing. And on the other far end of the bench, you have, you know, Churchill, you know, being generally in one of his more magnanimous moods. And then there's a space between them. And this is something that uh, historian and biographer Lawrence Reese once pointed out uh, going into his fantastic documentary called uh, World War II Behind Closed Doors, Stalin, the Nazis, and the West, where they go into the Soviet experience. And this is very much ties into what JJ said. And the interesting thing is when you look at it, and we'll show throw up a picture on there, there is actually a gap between FDR and Churchill, a gap that would perfectly fit who? A nice Stalin-sized gap. <laughs> Bingo. And so this ties into JJ's inquiry, which is that during the war, you know, the best answer I could give to you is two words uh, in terms of uh, British American Canadian propaganda, and that is the term Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe. It was an alliance that really neither side ever wanted. I was just going to mention, uh, in regards to uh, the initial question from JJ, just yeah, Uncle Joe, that's how he was marketed to uh, the West. He yes. was this friendly man helping us win the war. But yes, should we go on to the next uh, final uh, mess of fact we got sent in? And this is from Samuel in Chicago. Uh, and he said, the fact that Hitler could have ended the war at Dunkirk, but didn't in part just to wait for the Luftwaffe seems pretty major. And this is definitely a part, once again, of World War II I didn't know about. So thank you very much, Samuel, for sharing this with us. I did not know that the war could have been ended at Dunkirk. Basically, what happened was when Hitler finally invaded the West. He invaded the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. And this is the famous portion where in Army Group A, uh, basically putting all of his panzer divisions together, burst through what was thought at the time the impassable Ardennes and basically raced all the way to Calais and, and the Channel Coast, which when you had the British and the French going into Belgium to meet the expected invasion through that route, because that's exactly how the Germans had done it in the first war, they ended up becoming surrounded. And the only, it, as they got whittled down, the only uh, major port that was still in their hands was that of Dunkirk, where over the span of, I believe, about 10 or 12 days, they managed to evacuate most of the British expeditionary force that was deployed Employed in Europe at the time, as well as a fair number of Frenchmen as well. And due to that, they managed to keep the core of the British Army. They lost all of their heavy equipment and a lot of their major weapons in France, and that was a serious issue. But it had, had that worked out differently, it would have been extremely uh, a very different thing. Basically, the way it comes down, and this is a long historical debate that historians really go back and forth on, you know, why didn't Hitler send in the Panzers to Calais to take out the pocket of the evacuating British and French? Why did he leave it to the Luftwaffe? There's a number of reasons why. And when you go back and you read German uh, generals' memoirs, believe me, they have plenty of revisionist interpretations of what happened during that. But essentially, Hitler allowed the Luftwaffe to try to finish the job, when in reality, he probably should have sent the Panzers in. It was a missed opportunity. Many people wonder why he didn't send them in. Some people like to suggest that because he had such a favorable view of the British Empire that he wanted to do it as a gesture to make peace, which I don't think was ever the case at all. And basically, he was halting his panzers there because he knew after fighting in the First World War what the fields of Flanders are actually like, that he needed to stop, refit, and rest. And ultimately, they got away, and it was a missed opportunity. Believe me, it is one of the amazing rabbit holes of World War II in terms of counterfactuals, which are obviously impossible. Alternate history, whatever you want to call it, 
but it was one of the most questioned and still debated aspects of the Second World War, where, if it had worked out differently, there would have been very little for Churchill to be able to resist uh, any further Nazi aggression, assuming they could have gotten across the channel anyway, but that's a different story. There we go. No, um, yeah, but that's, a, that's something I didn't I know about. It's a big what if of um of World War Two. Thank you very much for Samuel for sharing that with us. This is the AD History podcast. So now, Paul, your story for us today is very interesting, and it's talking about how someone uses their power, and as you mentioned, it, it kind of interplayed somewhat with what was going on in Britain at the time. Undoubtedly. So. When most people think of the Roman Empire, they think about people like Sulla, Julius Caesar, Pompey, Mark Antony, Augustus, Caligula, who we've obviously talked about before. But somebody that often gets overlooked and really shouldn't is Domitian. Domitian was the third and final emperor at the time, Princeps. They didn't begin using the term emperor until the beginning of the second century as the youngest son of Vespasian and the younger brother of Titus, both of which ruled before he. He had a mother and a older sister, but both of them died fairly early on. And this left Domitian in a very strange place in terms of his upbringing, because as far as the people that would be supporting him and would have made up his family in Rome, both of them were dead. And both his father and his older brother were making names for themselves off on campaign. And so in many ways, oddly enough, Domitian grows up almost as the forgotten child. He's mostly looked after by his uncle, which would be Vespasian's brother. And he's very, very light in the purse. He doesn't have very much, by the way, of access to personal means, even though he's relatively high born. The Flavians are of the equestrian class, which is just below the patrician senatorial class. They're not quite up there, but they own land, they're Roman citizens, that sort of thing. And for the most part, he's largely left alone and in many ways quite forgotten. He struggled quite a bit due to this lack of means. So when you hear Suetonius and Tacitus talk about the origin story of Domitian, they talk about somebody who very much grew up a loner, suspicious, dour mercurial from the very beginning. And because his, his father and his brother were off making names for themselves, he didn't have any sort of great claim of his own. He never had any serious legitimate military triumphs, which could have legitimized his claims in various causes later on. They did some window dressing to that end, but it never really worked out. And until he got to about the age of 18, where he was finally out on his own, he received education that was commensurate with the class that he was born into. But nobody would ever have taken him seriously as somebody to keep their eye on. And it didn't really look like he had any great prospects anyway. But this all very much changes in what we know today to history as the year of the four emperors. This, by pure fate, was Domitian's first big break. And Patrick, you and I have touched upon the year of the four emperors over the last couple of episodes, but we've never really looked into what that actually entailed. And I think it's fair to say, guys, that it was pretty much a mess, especially because when it came to ascension to the, the Emperor Princeps role, there was never any formalized means of succession. So you get a lot of coups, you get civil wars, uh, assassinations, all that wonderful stuff. Very seldom is power peaceably and in consensus transferred to a particular individual. And at this time, it basically gets kicked off in 68 AD when the infamous Nero ends up committing suicide. And it begins this great succession struggle that lasts a little over a year that they call the Year of the Four Emperors. In a compact explanation of extremely complicated events, after Nero committed suicide, the Senate immediately made Galba, who was then governor of modern-day Spain, northern Spain to be sure, and they named him emperor, and he ruled for seven months. Galba ended up getting assassinated by Otho, who at the time was governor of what we know today as modern Portugal, and he ended up ruling for three months. And then upon Otho's defeat by the forces of Vitellius, Vitellius ended up rising into the role after being victorious 
at the first battle of Bedriacum. But at this point, through all of this, because Vespasian obviously comes out to be the head, Vespasian is sitting in Roman Syria, in Judea, because he's the commander on the scene initially, who is charged with the task of quelling the Jewish rebellion and sacking Jerusalem. And once Vitellius gets to this point, Vespasian has largely stayed out of this, but his own troops ended up taking matters into their own hands. He had something like a number of 80,000 troops under his command in, in Roman Syria at the time. In addition, he had really significant geopolitical advantageous location because one is he's controlling the Middle East, which controls a lot of trade routes. In addition to that, he is within striking distance of Egypt, which is an imperial province. Up to that point, you could only enter it with the express permission of the emperor slash princeps. And the reason why they were so touchy about this, and Patrick, we touched on about this when we were talking about Germanicus, is that Egypt becomes the major breadbasket for the empire. So in theory, you could have somebody that was aspiring to the top role, and if they controlled Egypt, you could coerce a change in regime because you could starve out Rome. And ultimately, Vespasian ends up following his troops' lead when he names himself emperor, and then he ends up going and fighting Vitellius at the second battle, uh, Bedriacum. And from a nominal standpoint, this is largely the point that of no return, where Vespasian will end up becoming emperor. But this drags out over a, another series of months in Rome itself when you have clashing between the two forces. Now, where the hell is Domitian during all of this? The Forgotten Son. Well, Domitian is in Rome, and he is under house arrest, because the forces that were controlling Rome at the time, which would have been largely under the thumb of Vitellius, wanted to make sure that no Flavian could inspire any sort of revolt or resistance within Rome itself. And when it became clear that his father was going to come out victorious, the way he ended up escaping his imposed isolation was sneaking out, it is rumored, being dressed like a priestess of the temple and god of Isis. This is really kind of scandalous stuff, especially when stories like this pop up later <laughs> in his rule, because he makes a lot of enemies, guys. <laughs> and so this is his big break. Big daddy's in charge. Nepotism up to this point is very commonplace in Roman politics. And until Vespasian, his father, arrives in Rome, which he waits to do until some of the various uprising and other provinces around the empire are ultimately quelled. Obviously, Britain is going through its own thing during all of this is very much part of the equation. And Vespasian ends up marching in Rome, in fact, in 70 AD. But prior to that, he was, Domitian was Vespasian's direct liaison to the Senate as the the ranking Flavian on the scene. And they gave him imperium, which in the context of Roman politics is pretty much word is law. That usually was a power that was given to elected consuls. It's something that ended up getting obtained by Augustus that kind of got bundled into this group of unique powers that made this princeps role. And he was clearly digging it. And through roughly the next decade between his father's ascension and then his brother and his brother died not too long from natural causes, even though, interestingly enough, Domitian most certainly did plot against him a couple of times, didn't really work out to anything. And obviously, Titus didn't give a shit. So he finally gets to this top role, a role that he never thought that he would ever achieve in 81 AD. This is very significant. Because the way Roman politics has largely worked since the rule of Augustus, I mentioned how the princeps emperor role at that point is kind of a bundle of unique powers. There is no real means of succession. And the reason this came about is because in the case of Augustus, he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. He was named as a successor in his will, and he ultimately triumphed after getting rid of the conspirators who killed Julius Caesar, getting through the second triumvirate. But he understood the one mistake that his adopted father, Julius Caesar, made that ultimately led to his death, which is at that time, politically, in Rome, you could not have a bald-faced dictatorship. So basically what Augustus did over an extended period of time was collect these various powers and ultimately come to the top role in almost a de facto ruling fashion. 
all of these powers that al allow him to essentially dominate Roman political life. And this largely gets carried through to the end of the first century. But the big thing there is that he was always keeping the window dressing of Roman republicanism, uh, simply because even, even then it was very difficult to have the Roman people and the Roman political establishment really sign on to that. They, in many ways, they were far more interested in the appearance of power than the substance of power. And so in this case, Domitian is interesting because he is what scholars believe really demarcates this departure from the Republican window dressing to a bald face, unambiguous dictatorship. And this is particularly interesting because, as I was talking about earlier, and this was a, an excellent quote by Stalin biographer Stephen Kotkin, who wrote and who has said that all dictatorships are a unique creation. It's very, very difficult to compare one to the other because they all come about in their own organic way. And there are certain individuals who are far more adept at it than others, to be sure. And in this case, Domitian is not simply departing from the Republican facade. He is trying to go from being a dictator to a despot. And this is a question I want to pose to you, JJ. How would you distinguish the difference between a dictator and a despot? Well, I guess it sort of comes down to this idea between uh, sort of the distinction that we sometimes make these days between what is an authoritarian government versus what is a totalitarian government, right? So you would say that, uh, you know, a, 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 a dictatorship, a sort of authoritarian government is merely one in which there's no real democracy, in which there's kind of like a authoritative sort of command based political system that are ultimately dictated by the whims of one person. But, you know, within that sort of uh, within that sort of dictatorial system, you can have, you know, relatively free civil society. You can perhaps even have uh, alternative power bases within the government. You know, you can have a, a civil service, you know, you can have the judiciary that perhaps has some degree of, of independence. You can even have to some degree a legislature that has some unique functions. But when you cross the line into into sort of like pure despotism, uh, what we would sort of say is closer to sort of like a, a, a totalitarian system, well, then you just kind of have like a society in which every aspect of the society is is geared around sort of the uh, sort of glorifying and entrenching the power of of the of the tyrant who's sort of ru ruling that country. And, and like tyrant's vision is so sweeping and so absolute and demands so much from every subject that there really is no uh, no space in that society that is independent of of government like the, the the society exists purely to sort of uphold the government's vision of what is good and what is right so this is in in sort of like a modern day society we would sort of say something like well you know egypt is like a dictatorship whereas north korea is like a totalitarian despotism and so i think that when we talk about uh, sort of the history of 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 Rome and all that, we sort of see an evolution in that direction too, right? Where it's sort of like, is is the goal merely to have a sort of like authoritarian political system that maybe is in some ways more efficient, as sort of the 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 dictators would define it, is sort of seen as a course correction for the kind of uh, you know, I suppose like what they would call sort of like the excesses of republicanism. Or is the goal ultimately to create a brand new sort of society from the from the from sort of like the 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 lowest form to the highest form, like basically where we're creating a new form of society that is really sort of based around government worship, worship of the tyrant. The tyrant is is such a dominating, uh, all encompassing figure in the society that you can't really distinguish the purpose of the country beyond that which glorifies and, and perpetuates the tyrant's power. Bloody dead on. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yes. And in this case, Domitian very much goes the despotism route. And in this case, it's, it's rather interesting because neither his father nor his brother that preceded him went the route that Domitian did because they also were very much in line with the idea of at least the Republican facade. And, and they were viewed quite favorably, certainly on an aesthetic level because of it, in, in, insofar as political theater is concerned, however you want to rate their accomplishments. But when he comes to power, 
The reason he comes to power is Titus doesn't have an heir. And so because he's the younger brother of Titus, or the spare, if you will, the Senate ultimately accedes to this third and last emperor of the Flavian dynasty, Domitian. And Domitian could very, very much be a, a dictionary picture next to the word or term micromanagement, because we're talking about the difference between dictatorship and a despotism. And as you so well put out, JJ, there can be other bases of power that have their their own their own little political fiefdom, if you will. And in addition to that, they can also be bases other bases of support of power that keep the dictator in office. In this case, Domitian goes and he centralizes all of Roman administration and all of its bureaucracy into his personal working chambers. And obviously, this is something that has good reason to piss off a lot of people because ultimately he just deprived them of whatever realm of political power that they seem to have. And this took on some very demonstrative things on the aesthetic level. First off, as far as the Senate goes, up to that point, their power and their importance in the Roman Empire and the imperial portion of Roman history that we're in very much were sidelined. But at the very least, whether you're talking about Augustus or Vespasian or whomever, they would still make the show of consulting the Senate before they took on a decision. Even if they were completely certain in that they were going to do what they were going to do, at the very least, they made very good political theater in that way. And that wasn't the case at all with Domitian. A number of reasons for it. One is he really had a chip on his shoulder against the senatorial class. He didn't particularly trust them. And I'm sure that had a lot to do with some of the struggles in his upbringing as essentially being the forgotten Flavian, if you will. And he, he didn't stop there, though, because one of the things that the various people made in kind of secret asides is when it came to Domitian and his decision making, he always kept his own counsel to the point where they would slyly joke that the only people in his working quarters were the flies. So he very much understood that he had the power, they had given it to him, and he was going to run with it. And this is the consequence of giving this sort of complete power to a single individual, and that not everybody is going to keep up with your political standards of political theater and Republican facade. But he got into life in a lot of very interesting and different ways. One is he also undertook, and this happened under his father and Titus as well, significant building projects throughout Rome. He was very interested in the aggrandizement of Rome, but at the same time, there was also a lot of practical aspects of this because Rome, of course, had undergone two major fires in 64 and 80 AD. And despite the fact this is not usually widely known, prior to, I believe it was the 18th, 19th century, Rome itself was always very vulnerable to a lot of natural disasters. And of course, they have two major ones in the span of under two decades. And so Rome was very, very much in need of this kind of rebuilding. And he took it upon himself not only to address this need, which was entirely necessary, he also used it as aggrandizement, but very much in this idea of self-aggrandizement. He broke a lot of conventions in doing this. Specifically, if you are rebuilding a, a particular, like say you have a temple or some sort of major political building, it would always, as we do today, they would still be dedicated. And what would happen prior to Domitian is that once it was restored on the plaque, it would then say constructed by, you know, the patronage of the original person who did it. That's how Vespasian would have done it. In the case of Domitian, he dispenses with that entirely and puts his personal stamp on this. And to describe it in any way in particular, the best way you could describe it, at least through Roman societal customs, it, you can almost describe it as tacky. <laughs> <laughs> it's tacky. I mean, guys, uh, let's, let's think about it for a moment. How widespread is this when it comes to both dictators and despots? where one of the ways they want to be remembered both in their time and after through grandiose building projects. We, I mean, where do we start? We've all seen the episode of Futurama when Bender becomes Pharaoh on that planet, right? 
<laughs> oh god yes 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 yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. That, that that's exactly what we're talking remember about remember me <laughs> that sort of thing <laughs> yes no it's, it's it's funny it's like none of this stuff ever ages well no. right it's like when you see all of those statues that saddam hussein made for himself and like now they just kind of seem like pathetic like no one considers this as like high art or like anything that's worth keeping it just sort of seems like a you know it's like a symptom of like the obvious vanity and insecurity of of a very sort of like ultimately sort of transient political person who like nobody is actually going to remember because there's a famous quote from uh from nelson mandela where he sort of said i would rather people ask why i don't have a statue than why i do have one Ooh. right which is the idea that like if you're truly a, a consequential and important person then your legacy will sort of stand on its own Whereas if you have to like run around constantly glorifying yourself, that's probably a pretty good indication that you don't actually have a uh, a legacy that is self evidently good. And you're absolutely correct. And this is just one of many ways he's departing from so much of what is expected of him based on those who assume the role prior. He also undertook the role of chief priest, and because he has this incredible idealized view of what how Rome should be viewed and how Romans sh should act, it allows him to very deeply influence what would be considered at the time the more conservative morality out of the history of the Roman Empire. But the other thing that was really kind of bizarre, and I found this really quite incredible, is that Domitian also proclaimed himself perpetual censor to uphold and monitor the morality and dealings of all Romans. Think about that. Not only does he want to influence the morality and values of it, he also wants to take on an active role in enforcing it based on his own judgment of the situation. And why would why would people go along with that? Like that's the sort of thing that I always wonder about. Like when when despots are engaged in like just such clearly sort of preposterous stuff. Particularly like when they're when they're clearly like unsuited to the task, just in terms of their own sort of like moral character, <laughs> you you wonder like why why people sort of humor them to such a degree. I mean, I guess it's fear. Well, I have to imagine that. So I think it's difficult for the three of us to really understand because we've never lived under that kind of uh, of system, and maybe our feelings would be deeply influenced when it comes down to being able to provide daily bread, having your house rebuilt after a pair of major fires, and just general basic need that basically say to themselves, well, this was chaos prior to this, but at the very least, we have food on the table. That's my only guess, guys. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Fear. fear makes people do stuff. <laughs> it's very much an old story in that way. But in terms of the, the morality and perpetual censor, the people of Rome obviously experience this. But the folks that are most directly affected by these really sweeping intrusions into personal life are the patrician senatorial class and the equestrians, because they're the ones that are closest into him. And in addition to sort of this idealized control, he also has the ability to keep his own personal eye on them and keep them in line. And ultimately, they're the ones who suffer from this because all of them have some kind of bizarre, lavish personal life that they don't want out there. That's certainly not good for them politically. And insofar as this goes, Domitian is also one of the ultimate hypocrites, because despite this grandiose interjection into the, the morality and censorship of everyday Roman life, his personal life is an absolute mess. And he took this fairly far at times. I believe there was even a senator who notably, it came to the attention of Domitian that he had a wife who had cheated on him. He had divorced her, and then he ended up taking her back, which to him was a fairly big no-no and made sure to basically publicly humiliate him in the process. It, it was really quite bizarre. And in terms of just kind of keeping this upper crust Romans captive, he had a number of ways to go back to go after them. So in addition to all of this centralized control and uh, the, the idea that he's looking to influence most aspect of Roman society, it also very much came into his personal life. Because one of the interesting things about Domitian is, one, he had almost no humility. 
He was extremely self-conscious, and he was a notable sadist. He was apparently known for actually taking pleasure in the pain of others, whether it be torture or execution. And he was so mercurial, even if he caught wind of some very minor joke at his expense, he would have these people executed. This is not a joke. He very much took the, these personal slights and ended people's lives in the process. I mean, I, I, that's something that I cannot imagine living under. That's something that I have so much trouble understanding. And obviously, it's incredibly disturbing. And he was also very self-conscious about his hair. <laughs> he really, really didn't like the fact that he was balding. So if you look at any sort of remaining statues of Domitian, he has a big, full head of hair, despite the fact that he was experiencing male pattern baldness. And you know this is the case, not just because of the histories that were written about him at the time, but you look at a bust of his father, and his father obviously didn't care nearly as much as his youngest son did, because you can see that same male pattern baldness. <laughs> you know, this is not history ex you know, exacerbating the truth or anything. It's really quite fascinating in so far as that goes. On top of that, he also did something that I think in many ways is a very common occurrence when you're talking about a despotism, and that is the grooming and expansion of a cult of personality. So when Roman emperors died, most of the time shortly thereafter, they're proclaimed by the Senate as being a god. And if for some reason they did not receive that decree, it usually means he was pretty unpopular at the time of his death. And they also had no issues with retroactively removing it later or putting it on. It was very much part of the political machinations that made Rome what it was and, and how it operated. And so in the case of Domitian, he very much towed the line in this regard because in the Italian peninsula, in Rome, one of the greatest cultural taboos a living emperor can ultimately stumble upon is the idea of even insinuating divinity while they are still alive. Now, there are cults of the emperor elsewhere in the empire. The Romans allowed the locals to kind of do their thing, but when it came to the Italian peninsula, when it came to Rome, that's where it really counted for a lot of them. And he made sure to do, proclaim the divinity of both his recently dead brother and his father. And within this cult of personality, he was also a great disciple of the goddess Minerva, which is a, another thing entirely. But he was very much what you could describe as born again. In this case, ultimately, when it comes to his rule and what defines it, this is something you and I discussed, I think it was back even in the first episode, Patrick, which are the, the three P's of power mm -hmm. in terms of how somebody in a position like Domitian would end up cultivating that kind of power and control. The first one is politics, the second one is privilege, and the third one was purge. <laughs> and believe you me, guys, he did the hell out of all of it, especially the purge part. And so, like I was mentioning to you earlier, most of the folks that were the victims of this were the upper class of Roman society because they were certainly the ones that are most visible. And he's the, they're the ones who very, very much, he has the chip on his shoulder for them. Like I said, he is very much born again in this Roman tradition, both in terms of the values and in terms of the religious aspects as well. And when he brought people in, insofar as he did into his political circle, he was very interested in malleable figures, folks who would do what he says, were on board regardless, and were capable of following out. And, and for him, Domitian, his, his highest virtue in terms of ruling was that loyalty. He made sure to bring in his own people that would carry out his edict with very little, if any, resistance, which is not terribly unusual. It's something that everybody in that position generally does if they have any interest in remaining there. and. On top of that, we get into the three Ps at regarding his sadistic streak. So, like I was mentioning to you earlier, he he was very he was very mercurial, he was very changeable. One day he could smile at you, you'd be executed the next, or it could be dour and suspicious, and then you get some sort of promotion. And there's this classic story that's told about Domitian and Domitian dinner parties. Have you guys ever heard about Domitian dinner parties? No. No. Okay, this definitely goes into his sadistic streak. <laughs> he has a formal dinner, and he invites figures of 
all sorts of importance in Rome. And in doing so, all of all the cloth, all the drapings are black. He makes the food, insofar as it's possible, black. It's a very darkened room. And everybody who is sitting there notices this great display of this very dark image that he is looking to project, and quite successfully from what I had. And it is said the reason he did this is because he took sadistic pleasure in these people squirming, thinking that this could be their last meal. <sighs> now, granted, that could be you know, the salacious Suetonius at work again, but unfortunately, insofar as this goes, it does kind of very much meet his personal level of sadism. Like I said, anybody that has this little humility and is, is that sensitive and is so violent in response, it's very difficult to imagine, but it, it's also very disturbing as well. And on top of that, in terms of how he handled his political dealings, I was mentioning earlier, obviously Domitian ultimately came to this kind of prominence due to no other reason than nepotism. His father became emperor. His brother succeeded his father. His brother didn't have an heir. So Domitian came to power. Despite being the greatest profiteer from nepotism, he was absolutely assiduous in never practicing it. In addition to that, he was also very weary of providing opportunities to anyone in that patrician senatorial class because of the chip on his shoulder that he has against them. And so he generally prefers working with others of his class, in this case, the equestrians. And putting that all aside, that very much works into the idea of bringing in malleable people to do his bidding. The other really interesting part, and I think, JJ, this will really hit home with you. He conducted a vigorous anti-corruption campaign. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> that's obviously the sort of uh, the all-encompassing pretext that I think most uh, most tyrants use when they're engaging in purges of some form or another. I mean, it's certainly the ex the all-purpose excuse that the, uh, the, the Chinese regime uses these days whenever they feel like clearing house a bit. It's always like, well, we're just weeding out corruption, corrupt officials, corrupt bureaucrats, corrupt politicians. We're cleansing the party and the nation. It's, uh, no, it's a tale as old as time. No, oh, it, it, it absolutely is. But we, we look at this, he, you know, he, he has his hands in everything from the economy where he revaluates uh, Roman silver coins from 90% to 98%. He undertakes considerable building to rebuild Rome. In fact, he, he basically spends the entirety of the coffers from all that was taken as booty from the, the sacking of Jerusalem. And depending on the figure you were talking to, and this is something scholars bring up from time to time, that there were other major figures at the time. Granted, they could be very bitter for obvious reasons, but they actually saw it as profligate spending, even though from everything scholars can tell, the books were actually pretty well balanced under Domitian. In addition to the fact he did a fair amount in terms of tax reform and collecting taxes more efficient, obviously, to keep the coffers from going dry. So we, we look at this now and we, we kind of get this inside picture where he wants to control everything. He's basically setting out Rome on his own image. He goes and undertakes an incredible building project. And one of the biggest difference here between him and a lot of other despots is in the case of Domitian, a lot of these restoration and rebuilding was entirely necessary. Whereas any time you usually see a totalitarian or authoritarian state, a dictator or a despot become flush with cash, usually they're pretty well known for building bridges to nowhere. Or in their own glory. Yeah. Exactly. That's something that is rather fascinating. And all told, Domitian is relatively well liked as an emperor because even Suetonius gives him credit when he says that, well, you know, the guy was a major league asshole, but his ability for administration and getting things done was genuinely impressive. Of course, the cost for bringing back Rome to glory rebuilding the city, undertaking all of these reforms is you lose so many of your personal freedoms in the process and not just the patrician senatorial class, but it's generally true of everybody. It was a very bizarre time. And yet, despite all of this and undoubtedly making many enemies because he's taking privilege away from the senatorial class by this really rigid moralistic intervention, he's bringing in people that are very, very much up to the neck in his view of politics. And on top of that, he has no issue with getting rid of anybody in his way 
for any reasons. Yet at the same time, for the most part, he's rather popular because he is getting things done. He's getting things done at a time when Romans desperately need it. Because at this point, what, we we're only a little bit more of a de than a decade outside of the year of the four emperors, which Patrick, you and I, in our last episode, when we look at the Colosseum and that grand gesture, starting with Vespasian and the Flavian dynasty, they were interested in making a distinct point and that point was to Roman citizens themselves. Yes, no, um, the, the, the Flavian dynasty, one of their key priorities was let's keep the people happy. And they all did that in their own different ways, clearly. Vespasian and Titus both had the construction of the uh, Colosseum, among other things. Whereas uh, the mission was just, you're going to have to like me. I'm going to force you to like me by running a dictatorship slash despot. <laughs> Kiss me on yes, a yeah. <laughs> And uh, like, like we mentioned before, I just find this so fascinating how this story, despite being 1900 years before right now, it's just this is so similar to so many other dictatorships and despots we have seen in history. The whole doing surface, it always seems the same case, doing very surface level things that look like you're doing a good job and to appease people, like we saw with a, with a, with a Domitian doing all these amazing things making things look tacky as you said it oh yeah yeah and we see that with other dictators sort of hitler creating all the uh, construction work to appease people and it's just it's such a you know a t tale as old as time itself clearly. make the trains a... run on time and then you get a pass on so much so much else you know people are very people are very pragmatic and people sort of like order of values and like what they virtue and what they will sacrifice can often be very, uh, can be disturbing to see, you know, what people are willing to give up in exchange for, for what, you know, it is not always a, a morally sort of ordered universe in the way that I think we're, we, uh, we like to believe human, humanity would default to. It's interesting. You, you mentioned making the trains run on time. I think something you guys probably know this, but something that's, it's kind of, I, I don't think is widely understood about that comment and I, I can I can say this with pure immunity, being Italian. Yes. In Italy, we're not exactly known for our punctuality, so making the trains run on time was something of a of an accomplishment in terms of the <laughs> infamous legacy of Il Duce. Yes. A, a question. A question I uh, have quickly is: we talked about how he became, he took over and became a despot, but he was always ready to become emperor. Just like. Why do you think he wanted to rule in that way? What do you think was the key factors behind him? Because he was he was going to become emperor no matter what. He was the spare. He was the next in line for the quote unquote throne. Not that we're allowed to call it a throne. We're allowed to call him a king. But why do you think he he, he had rule? Why do you think he wanted to rule in such a sadistic way? You have to couch this by saying right off the top. This is all speculation in my own yes, interpretation yes. based on the question you asked. So I do think it is important to remember Domitian's upbringing, like I said, being the forgotten Flavian. This is a dude that very much was, for all intents and purposes, on his own and at times had to do some very undesirable things to survive even in an explicitly rated podcast we're just not going there with this one <laughs> and so it does seem that he does seem to grow up with a certain chip on his shoulder but it's hard to know his explicit thinking because he confided in so few in many ways you, you have to imagine somebody i hate going back because i'm not a psychologist. We don't have the neuroscience expert here joining no. us today, even though I think she would have a lot of interesting things to <laughs> say about it. You have to imagine the upbringing as we understand it probably affected him in a profound way. In addition to the fact that not only does the outside world not look at him as having as someone to keep their eye on because they have grand future prospects, it's hard to imagine that he believed that he did as well. How could he have? How could he have predicted this wild windfall of fate in a very short period of time makes him a total outsider and then makes him the ultimate insider? I feel like that's a trope that gets thrown around so much nowadays, but it's so damn good. And there's a reason for that. So I do think he had a chip on his shoulder. I also, on top of that, just based on the way he rules, and we're talking about the three P's of power and one of them being politics, I do believe he had a, a definitive compass in terms of his values regarding Roman religion and Roman culture that 
were extremely important to him. And he probably, given all of his dealings and the fact that for the most part, you know, he was on the outer fringes of the upper crust of Roman society, he probably saw this as an opportunity that he never thought he was going to have. And because he didn't really have any of that breeding that comes with most of the people who come into power in that position. So whether it be the military conquests like you see with Vespasian, whether it's Tiberius getting the throne from Augustus and, and all the various ways in which that happens, this guy is is totally on the outside. And he has, there was never any reason to believe he would be there. And I don't wouldn't believe him if he told me that he truly believed that he was from early on because his horse there's no way that you could have come to that conclusion based on the facts at the time. He definitely seemed like he had a chip on his shoulder. He definitely seems like somebody who was very emotionally starved. But like I said, I couch this by saying I'm not a psychologist and I touch this very, very lightly because I have, tr you know, psychoanalyzing historic figures can get you into a lot of trouble because, you know, you could say Stalin grew up and he was beaten by his father. He becomes this ruthless despot, probably the most successful despot of all time. But there are plenty of people that, that get a quick slap to their rear end from your parents, and they don't go on to kill millions of people throughout their life. So it is very difficult to go in that way. But, so, but like I said, he didn't have that breeding. He didn't have any genuine introduction into politics, save various ceremonial roles that he took up when his father became emperor and then his brother, where he was taking, uh, he served several terms as, as consul. And despite some other really lame attempts prior to his accession and during it, he never gained any sort of legitimacy in terms of conquest. So he didn't have the breeding when it came to political life. He didn't have the military upbringing and everything that would have come with it. In many ways, this guy was the ultimate oddball who got his hands on the wheel and despite all convention, was going to do it the way he wanted to do it and damn the rest. And that is precisely what happened. It's very hard to say, Patrick, but I can definitely say that given the zeal by which it seems in which he, he, he prosecuted his duties, there was definitely something unusual going on between the ears. Okay. <laughs> it's very interesting as well. I'm just curious. That was my curiosity of what I wanted to know. Um, now, forgive me if this is going into spoiler territory because history does have spoilers. If you're going to cover this in our next installment but if you're not i'd just love to know now how does his story end and how, how is he regarded throughout the rest of rome's history unless you're going to go into it in the next episode then we can stay quiet on that one i'll touch on it the reason i chose to do Domitian today is because of this marker of how we go from the facade of republicanism under you know secretive one-man rule to just bald-faced despotism because i think there's a lot of value in that because you see that pattern work out in a lot of places in history. And you and I, Patrick, we, one, of the, one of the great historical fascinations you and I connect on is, is, of course, Joseph Stalin. And in this case, it's kind of hard to ignore him because he is the gold standard <laughs> of dictatorship. Nobody ever did it better than, than he did or in the way he did it. And the interesting thing about that, and I'm just going to put this as a quick aside, Despotism and dictatorship is definitely a unique skill, which ultimately generates a unique creation. And one of the interesting things about Stalin in particular is that in the late 30s, when he's undertaking the Great Purge, whether it's the party, the NKVD, the Red Army, during all of that, he is studying various dictators and iron-fisted rulers from antiquity. And the reason we know this is because now we have his ha our hands on his personal library and we can see in his red and blue colored pens that were made by the Sacco and Vanzetti factory of Moscow at the mm -hmm. time <laughs> a rather interesting name from a rather interesting political power and it's entirely marked up so we do know that a lot of these folks that followed someone like Domitian were also reaching in the lessons into the past to learn how to be a better dictator and become a despot because in the end of the day and you can't imagine otherwise Every dictator ultimately truly aspires, for the most part, I'm sure there are exceptions, to becoming a despot. And no, it's not a spoiler. He ends up getting murdered by his Praetorian Guard, and then Nerva ends up getting proclaimed emperor by the Senate. But that wasn't the big reason that I want to finish off with any flurry, but it's because this is the mark where 
the gloves are off. This is what we are. And we're no longer window dressing. No, it's 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 interesting. And I, I the one sort of thing that I would just sort of say is that I, I always think that there is a kind of romantic notion, I think, that that this is how dictatorship, you know, always happens, you know, that somebody sort of comes to power and dismantles what had previously been a very sort of like respectable democratic system and turns it into something terrible sort of through his own unique perversions. But it is very true that like all like what you said earlier is that all di dictatorships are different and all of them arise in different contexts and different circumstances and arise in response to particular situations. So I think that it's uh, as much as I think that these kinds of stories are, are in some respects sort of like the most romantic in a way in the sort of the small r sort of sense of the word in that they have this kind of like sort of gothic nature. I mean, like just the sort of way that like, you know, the the story of the fall of democracy in Star Wars is kind of like based on on this kind of idea as well. You know, that like everything was going well, but then sort of through circumstances, someone sort of piece by piece dismantled the, 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 the democratic system and created something <laughs> horrifying and new. And that's, but it's not always the case, right? Like there are lots of times in which there's dictatorships and that basically just arise in a society that's already a dictatorship of some form or another or is already sort of like a deeply undemocratic society. And it perhaps accelerates uh, the undemocratic nature of, of, of a society that, you know, doesn't have any sort of defensible political institutions already. So that's that's just sort of one thing that I would say. You know, it's interesting because you bring up George Lucas and it, a lot of people like to claim, especially in the prequels, that it, it's, it's the best civics lesson in, in democracy that they've ever seen. And I, I, I tend to disagree with that for a number of reasons. But there was one weird thing. I don't know if you guys ever noticed it in terms of the way Lucas wrote the story and and, and democracy as a value. It almost wasn't as if it was being prescribed as, you know, the best and most fair system. It was almost portrayed in a way to an extent where democracy was almost a religious value. Yes, yes. I think I think that if we're getting off off on a off on a off topic tear, I I think that that is a Do it. I think that is a good critique of of sort of the simplistic morality of the Star Wars universe, which is to say that yeah, like there's just a lot of sort of like blunt assertions that things matter because they matter, you know, that like the Jedi say this is what is important, therefore it's good, you know, and that the other people say a different sort of system. The Sith people say that they don't believe in that, and that's bad because we sort of just say that they're bad. And you're just, it's, it's, it is, it's kind of like this very sort of spiritual, sort of pseudo religious kind of moral system that's based on appealing to a kind of, uh, I mean, in, in some respects, I suppose it is very Roman in that way, that there is kind of just this idea that there's this kind of correct sort of pseudo-religious order of the universe and that it's the the job of the good government and the good uh, the good ruler to kind of adhere to like what the gods you know believe should be the case i mean in star wars world they don't have gods but you know in the way that they sort of appeal to some higher power it seems similar and to me it's why i think the morality of those of those movies is not terribly interesting no it, it really isn't and you know the, what, one, the reason i came to that conclusion a while back is i was thinking about the final face-off scene in Revenge of the Sith between Obi-Wan and then Anakin, who had just become Vader, and they're having their long, extended, pointless duel on Mustafar. And Anakin says, I'm securing peace for my new empire. And then Obi-Wan says back, your new empire? I believe in the yes. Republic, in democracy. And all I could think to myself is it, it comes off almost as it has definitive religious undertones to it that actually I find quite bizarre looking back and, and watching it many years later. And not to really go too far off here, but it's kind of a fun rabbit hole. In terms of the, the Republic in Star Wars and the Jedi's role in it, especially considering it's very large and obviously for the most part they get away from what they should be doing and they basically become really, really comfortable bureaucrats all, all told, is could you call the Republic in Star Wars a pseudo-theocracy? <laughs> yes, <laughs> because I mean, yeah, it, it, it uh, like what I said before, like so much of their sort of system of morality seems to be based on the premise that like there is a class of people called the like the Jedi who believe in, in their, I don't know, religion. And you're just supposed to completely take it for granted that they're always in the right about everything because they are 
yeah, like they have some sort of like weird spiritual authority that's never really sort of fleshed out in the context of the film. And that people that are on the other side, people that are on the dark side or the Sith, they're just objectively evil because the Jedi say so. And that uh, I've often, there's been some fun writing, some sort of like lightly sort of tongue in cheek writing over the years uh, about why, like making the case for like the Empire, right? Like making the case that you know, that sort of Senator Palpatine, like what he argues is objectively true, like that the Jedi have just decided to murder him because he has a religion that's different than theirs and has basically just sort of said that, uh, you know, that anything can be justified in taking down a, an evil Sith Lord, right? Which who you're just told is bad because it's bad. You know, it's it's not, it, it isn't, it isn't really like objective analysis. It's, it's, you're, it's, it's kind of like sloppy writing. Yeah, and it's total hypocrisy because, you know, Obi-Wan says only the Sith deal in absolutes. Bullshit. <laughs> the Jedi only deal yes, in absolutes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's ridiculous. That and, of course, I have this ongoing debate with a friend of mine in terms of my criticism of the Jedi, which are which are numerous. <laughs> and and, I, and the way I best described it was I consider myself Jedi skeptic. Uh -huh. Especially when you consider, and I'm sure I'll have Star Wars fans beating over me over the head with this, and there are other people who have gone down this road too. There's a great YouTube channel called Generation Tech who kind of goes into all the, these Star Wars uh, scenarios and kind of does that tongue-in-cheek that you're talking about. I, I think to myself, okay, so they're keeping very, very careful record of infants born throughout the Republic to, to track middle chlorine counts, and then they take this infant away from their parents keep them away from their parents for the rest of their life. The child has absolutely no say in it whatsoever. They're brought into this monastic order, told to believe absolutely this because you have this power and you can't have any connection. So that way they can never know their parents. So they have total control and basically raise them from birth after taking it from their parents, I don't even, I'm assuming because it's Star Wars and it's the Jedi, it's always done willingly, but I don't buy into that at all. And basically give them no agency and raise them in something that honestly you could kind of call a cult. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, given just how uh, little understood and how rare these individuals are in, in the Star Wars universe. Are, are the, could the Jedi actually be interpreted as forcibly recruiting child <laughs> soldiers? I like that. <laughs> It's pretty nuts. And that and, of course, was the Empire completely evil? Well, they did everything possible to portray that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I've, I've always looked at those films and, and the political side of them and, and the role of the Jedi. And I kind of shake my head and I can say to myself, well, the intentions are good, but the road <laughs> to hell is paved with yes. good intentions. There's just no question why Sidious won. And to be honest with you, as a Star Wars fan over many years, I find the dark side a hell of a lot more interesting, and especially Palpatine, because he is, in the words of Plinkett, he's just evil and he's loving it. It really just brings it up a notch. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I also like to pretend that the sequel trilogy never happened. Yeah, so just to point that out. Any closing thoughts, guys? No, I think I think we well and truly covered uh, everything about... Uh... Uh, b b just about Star Wars. I forgot what we're actually talking about. Is this a Star Wars podcast? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> what podcast have I wandered into? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of our, the spontaneity of what we do. JJ, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, yes, thank you so much. Hey, Thanks for having me. You know, when I thought about extending the invitation and I, and I looked at the topic that was coming up, I thought, at least for myself, I thought to myself, this, this is a guy who we want to talk about because the themes are timeless. And uh, your track record in these matters is is beyond well, doubt. It is, it is a fact. And it's been wonderful having you on. And if you're ever interested, we'd love to have you back. It's been great. I had a lot of fun having you here. For sure. Well, thanks so much. It was it was my pleasure. And JJ, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at the Washington Post, where I write a weekly column. And uh, you can also just find me on the social medias, on, on Twitter and all the rest. If you just search for JJ McCullough. Oh, and I also, of course, I have a YouTube channel, which you can also find if you search for JJ McCullough in uh, in YouTube, or just search if you can't you can't handle my weird, complicated last name, just search for JJ Canada in YouTube, and I'm sure I'll pop up. This is the AD History Podcast. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end of our journey for today. Patrick, where can people find us? 
You can find me personally on Twitter at NameExplainYT, and of course you can find me on my YouTube channel, NameExplain. And for myself, you can find me on my newly minted Twitter account at the handle at PKD in History, as well as on the social media news platform Quartz by searching Paul K. DeCostanzo. Also, take a peek at my reader email submitted Q&A column, the World War II Brain Bucket over on TGNR. We have a link down in the description. If you enjoy AD history and you want to support the show, be sure to leave a glowing five-star review. Or if you're on YouTube, like, share, and subscribe. AD history really does depend on listeners like you leaving reviews and ratings to help support it. Now over to Anna to properly send you guys home. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Yes, thank you for listening. Be well. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History Podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at AD History PC, as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash AD History Podcast and Instagram as AD History Podcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at adhistorypodcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. On behalf of Paul and Patrick, thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. We will see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.